you're listening to The New Paris. I'm your host, Lindsay Tremuda. It's that time of year again, gift giving, baking, holiday planning, which means it couldn't hurt to draw your attention to France for a little inspiration. This will be a two-part episode all about sweets featuring two authors whose books you absolutely should be picking up for yourself or offering as gifts this season. To start, I'm joined today by Alexandra Crepanzano, a James Beard award-winning writer and longtime dessert columnist for the Wall Street Journal. She's also most recently the author of Gâteau, The Surprising Simplicity of French Cakes. The book includes more than 100 recipes of classic and regional cakes fit for the home baker. Our discussion tackles her enduring connection to France, the baked goods she tried in Paris on her recent trip, and why there's no reason to feel intimidated if you're baking the French way. Bonjour, Alexandra. Hello, Lindsay. <laughs> <laughs> it's good to see you. I, I got to see you recently in person in Paris after, you know, s- several years, several COVID years, which, which means it was more like 10 years. Um, but the last time we saw each other, we were at La Bourse et la Vie in Paris. So uh, the opposite of ghetto, you know, which is the, the topic of our conversation here. But but you're someone who, you know, that it wasn't unusual for you to be back in Paris then, nor was it unusual for you to be back in Paris now. What is your relationship to Paris? Because you mentioned in your book that you spent a number of years here as a child. What was that connection? Absolutely. And I still remember, I have to say about that lunch, that we all had the chocolate mousse and the baba rum. <laughs> Do you remember that? <laughs> uh, so good. Uh, so my relationship to Paris goes all the way back to my being a, a really young child. I started traveling back and forth to Europe from New York at seven months old. And yeah, and and kind of kept going. My mother was the European correspondent for The New Yorker. And so she was here every, or I should say there, every six weeks. I'm now in New York. Uh, and at the age of 10, uh, I moved. Uh, my, my father was on sabbatical. He thought he was going to spend one year teaching with Derrida. This was the moment of, of kind of literary theory at its peak. And, uh, and my mother was going to kind of lean in and spend a year in Paris. And I enrolled at school. And of course, they ended up staying 16 years. <laughs> so that was that that one year, uh, you know, grew and grew and grew. And I, I ended up coming back to Harvard and to graduate school. And then but I have just always gone back and forth and feel it deeply at home in France. And this isn't your first book, um, but certainly the perhaps the most French of the the books that you've done. I mean, because you've done a book about London, you've done a book about Los Angeles, and now sort of bringing it full circle, right? I was, you know, I've been saving Paris. And, you know, the last two books I wrote were really about cities in the midst of culinary transformation. And, and I, you know, I felt that London had had terrible food and then suddenly the food was very good and I wanted to dig in and figure out why and kind of the who, how, why and where of it. And as I was writing that book, I realized the same thing was happening in Los Angeles. So I wanted to dig into that. And with Paris, I felt that we were kind of on the cusp for a little while. This was before the pandemic of seeing another real food transformation in Paris. And so I was kind of, I had it a little bit back burner. And, um, and then I was really about to, to start researching in 2019, 2020, <laughs> we all know what happened. And uh, at the start of the pandemic, I found myself trapped in Connecticut, unable to get to, to France. It drove me crazy that I couldn't get to France, even though I had no plans to get to France. There was something about the borders being closed that made me feel shut out of my, my own home. Uh, and I, I, started, I started this book. And it really was my way of writing my way home in so many ways, I think. Baking and my you, way, writing and, my but, way but you started it because you essentially gave yourself almost a mission, right? To, to bake a recipe a day or several a day. Wasn't that it? I thought it was going to be a very short pandemic. So at first I thought, let's, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to perfect a cake, a French cake every single day, but a very simple one. You know, these are all, all, all what, what 
one might make at home, certainly not what, what one would buy. Uh, and, uh, and I was thinking, oh, it'll be at most 70 pages, 70 recipes, maybe 50, the pandemic will be over. It'll be one of those little books you buy at the checkout counter at Barnes and Noble as an impulse purchase. And, uh, and then somewhere into the, you know, 160th recipe that I was testing, I, I looked around and I said this, obviously, we know this pandemic is not ending anytime soon. And more importantly, I realized I had a very different kind of book. I realized in doing a, a huge amount of research that there really isn't a book in the English language on the cakes that the French bake at home. There's, there are so many books on patisserie. There are so many books on restaurant desserts. There are so many books on kind of extravagant French desserts um, that maybe have one or two cakes inside, maybe maybe a bouche de Noël. But there was nothing that had yogurt cakes and pound cakes and very simple apple cakes and, you know, the, the absolute basics. And I think the reason for this is twofold. In France, it's that people, you know, don't think you need a recipe for that, right? And uh, <laughs> in America, people just assumed that the French either, you know, buy everything at a patisserie or that they have genetic superpowers and make these unbelievable confections after 10 hour days of work. Well, in fairness, I do think that maybe the mass media is responsible for creating that assumption that the French just have some superpower with everything that they do, right? The way they take care of themselves, the way they live, the way they bake or cook. But but you're right. It's uh, I mean, even my mother-in-law will say things like, you know, I, oh, I had to spend all day preparing this thing. But it's because she doesn't, you know, first of all, she's retired. And second of all, she's making things that are perhaps a little bit more elaborate because they're for a special occasion. But if she were going to make something on a weekday or just for the same evening, it's going to be, you know, half hour or an hour in the oven and it's done and it doesn't require a lot of preparation and maybe you even have she has the ingredients already in her pantry exactly and that that is precisely what i wanted to get at and i think particularly during the pandemic i you know i knew this book wouldn't obviously come out until later but i wanted to to do two things i think people are scared of baking and baking is in fact probably the easiest aspect of cooking uh and it is also in some ways the one with the most wow factor I will say for very little, people feel very loved when you bake them a cake and a cake can take 15 minutes to put in the oven. So uh, it kind of yields an exponential reward. But I also, I also love the way that the, that the French do bake simply at home and they cook simply at home. And because they do that, they're able to do it every single night. And I think that, you know, in America, when we have a dinner party, it is often, you know, I'm going to get this book by a chef and I'm going to spend three days trying to do this. And then everybody comes to dinner and you're still in the kitchen and frantic and dinner doesn't happen until 11 at night and everybody is happily drinking wine uh, in the other room. And that's just no fun. <laughs> and and I I wanted to kind of open the door to this idea that if you if you really turn back to the classics, but the classics as they are today, then you can actually, you, you kind of create these back pocket recipes. You learn to make certain things that are, are absolutely beloved. You learn to do them so that they're almost second nature to you. So you no longer need a recipe and then you get to riff on them. And to me, that really is the essence of, of French cooking, which is they, you know, there's less of that, uh, that, desire for novelty and much more for things that they love really well made thoughtfully prepared using great ingredients um but moving with the seasons or the occasions so you, you touched on something that's very interesting which is this idea of novelty because you could say that in paris there are a lot of at least for shops there are some you know, boutiques that specialize in fad kind of pastry, right? Like these New York rolls that, you know, basically take croissant dough and laminated pastry and, and blend it with something a little yeah. bit more indulgent, like American style. So you see those or you see sort of donuts or you see uh, you know, maybe Taiwanese or Japanese desserts. But for the most part, and I remember asking uh, a chocolate maker, um, which again, it's not cake, but still, it's, I think it, it ties in, which is that 
even when you do a sort of incredible variety of flavors, even some more adventurous flavors, the best sellers remain the classics. And I think that you need to maybe to have some newness to keep people coming in. But ultimately, after they've tried that like new novel thing, you want them to stay for the basics, right? Um, how do Absolutely. you... How do you how do you think because I'm sure you noticed that when you came, right? There are all these sort of there's the French bastards, there's all these places that are kind of like, you know, riffing on the old but still trying to do something a bit new and fun and funky. Um and 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 it and sometimes it works. And so how do you see trend playing into great question. The, the you know, traditional I approach. I interviewed uh Michelac, who I love, who's, you know, such an incredible baker. I interviewed him last year about just the, the incredible Instagram presence he has. And, uh, and we started to talk about what people actually buy. And he said, you know, the new, the new kind of trendy, sudden dif difference in flavors. I know right now he's doing a lot with maple syrup, really get people in the door. To, but those people tend to take pictures. They tend to be tourists or they tend to be people who live in another neighborhood who are coming once. And he said he relies entirely on his his local clientele who come in for the basics but the basics really well done and i you know and i think that that is i think that that is true i think instagram has really had an, an extraordinary influence on this world because it has meant that everybody has to create something novel all of the time and yet you're absolutely right what actually does sell and what is the bedrock of all of these bakeries and all of these restaurants are the classics. So when I was just in Paris and saw you last week, I think it was last week, uh, I did. I went to Utopie, which, you know, has wonderful things with sesame, with black sesame and, and dark charcoal. But I saw so many people come in and just want a sandwich. And, uh, and then I went to Francois Perret at the Ritz and, uh, you know, and he has those oversized Madeleine and, and kind of different shaped things. But what I thought was absolutely fabulous of his was a long ham and cheese sandwich on a on a bread that wasn't really a bread. It was kind of a combination of a of a croissant uh, dough and a brioche dough. And it was amazing. So and he's incorporating, I mean, he's obviously incorporating uh modern elements into you know which also appeals to tour tourists because certainly at his boutique um the the sort of what do they call it le comptoir uh, du ritz or you know whatever it's called um you yeah. know you're getting a lot of neighborhood people but you're also getting a lot of visitors and that ham and cheese in a sandwich or in a in a in a, in a sort of uh package like that is very unique yes so he's changed, right? He has changed the form into something that is that is very, very catchy, and and that actually was delicious. And then around the corner was um, Cédric Crowley's uh, fantastic bakery, and I just I walked by and looked at the window, and there were these fascinatingly kind of Ameri Franco American things that looked like they were maybe a tart and maybe a cookie and some incredible combination of them that were absolutely heavenly that were you know almost was kind of a cookie base but then had all of the things that you normally put in a cookie on top of the cookie which was but, which was amazing. but what you're describing are you know professional bakers and people go to buy those kinds of things but what they're making at home is going to be a lot different so in your book you break it down into the you know, the extreme classics, much of which has a yogurt base, which I want to talk about. And then you have regional regional desserts, which, you know, you mentioned the ghetto basque, which is just one of my favorites. Um, and, and, and also some, you know, modern kinds of things that, you know, have, have clearly developed uh, over time. So going back to the yogurt cake, because I think that's probably the easiest dessert on the planet to make. Uh, why is that so popular? I mean, do you think it, it's just, it's the ease that makes it sort of the enduring favorite? I think it's like our Toll House chocolate chip cookie. You know, I I remember now I didn't I did not start school in France until I was until until I was ten, but I know that in maternelle, you know, you actually do learn to make a yogurt cake. It is part of the curriculum. And you know, you have right, you have you have the little jar of yogurt and you you dump it into a bowl and you you use that empty jar to measure out the rest of ingredients and then you whisk it up and you 
put it in a pan and bake it. And, and it is that first amazing discovery that you can take this kind of liquid mess that we call batter, put it into an oven and it comes out as this incredible cake. So I think, I think there's an immediate affection that is established really early across the country for yogurt cakes. The other thing about it though, is that once you do, again, once you have it memorized, then you just play on it for the rest of your life. So you know, I, I wasn't even intending to do this, but somebody counted and said I had 52 variations on the yogurt cake and the pound cake in the book because, you know, it, and and there could be so many more because you can you can add a little bit of minced rosemary and lemon. You could add a little bit of rosal hanout. You could add a little bit of makrat lime. You could add a little bit of yuzu juice. You could add chocolate chips. Uh, you could add little apple chunks soaked in calvados. Uh, you there's there is so much that you can do to suddenly play with that recipe. And I think you know what I've found in you know God now. 12 years having a dessert column in the Wall Street Journal is that when a recipe is structurally sound, you are set and then you can really experiment. Hmm. And, and the recipes that are, that I wanted to include in this book were very much those recipes. And when I say structurally sound, I do not mean in any way structural, like a, you know, a building ton of bricks, nothing like that, but, but, but that they are, they're proportionately right. And, and, and also consistent, right? You're going to get probably the same result each time you're doing them. Exactly, exactly. And uh, and then there is that wonderful practicality. And I think you and I would pr- probably both agree that the French are really practical and yeah. and very frugal. And so, you know, and that's, again, part of the reason I think that, you know, that they can eat well every single day is because, as we said, they're not trying to outdo themselves every single day mm. and because they are practical and, and, and frugal and they're reaching for their pantry ingredients. But what I noticed with the yogurt cake and seeing friends make it is that, you know, if you have kids, maybe you make two yogurt cakes and you're having people over to dinner and maybe you will brush the one that you're going to serve for grownups with a little bit of a, of a Gros Marnier soaking syrup or or something a little bit boozy and maybe add some creme fraiche on the side or something. And then you can have the the basic one and, and it'll go, it'll be an after school snack for the next three days. It's incredibly moist. It keeps it's um, and you just see that, that kind of that pleasure of nostalgia. I think, I think even for um, even for something as simple as yogurt cake, or maybe particularly for that nostalgia is part of, what makes food delicious to us and the French are deeply connected to that. And, you know, you don't, you don't get that by trying something completely radically new every day. No, no, no. And certainly if you live in a major city, you probably don't have time for that anyway. Um, I know that, that, you know, there's obviously the idea that the French make time for things and we love to, you know, use them as a model. And I would say, yeah, they, they still make, better use of, I think, their non-working time, but that doesn't mean they want it to be, you know, in the kitchen for hours and, you know, on a weekday baking. Um, but, you know, you do you do include, um, to, to, to bring up something that obviously has proliferated across France in, in the last, I'd say, 10 years, as we've seen coffee shops come, come into, you know, uh, come into permanent play in the landscape, are banana breads. And you have a very clever head note to that recipe that you include, which is les bananes, uh, un cake à la banane moelleuse. Yes. So you're, 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 you know, you're really highlighting the fact that it's pretty mushy if you're, yeah. if you're using it in the first place, but that has to do with let, you know, it's been right under their nose all this time, but they treat it or they treat or perceive the banana in a different way than the Americans do. What do you, what do you mean by that? Uh, you know, I think it's considered a tropical fruit. <laughs> you know, in the way that in America, we, you know, we slice it up and put it on cornflakes or we, you know, give it to babies in strollers or whatever, you know, it's just such a kind of, it's, I think a lot of Americans actually think that bananas are American, right? I mean, they're, <laughs> I hate to say it, but I think it's probably unfortunately true. But, uh, but when I've seen bananas, you know, certainly until the coffee gate, the coffee shop kind of, 
And, and can I tell you, I love, I love the new coffee in Paris. I'm so excited by the new coffee in Paris. Yes. Oh, thank goodness. Uh, but, but I did, I did love that, that they would treat bananas, which is absolutely true. As though they were, you know, as a tropical fruit and that it should be served with usually with mangoes or with kiwis or with pineapples. And, uh, and when you see it in tarts, it usually is. Uh, so, and then, yes, I absolutely wanted to specify that it is a very moist cake because otherwise people would think, you know, what, what is this, this thing, <laughs> right? Right, right. You know, that doesn't have enough flour and, or hasn't been cooked enough. And in fact, it is actually, a, it's a great recipe. It uses yeah, you include, you include coconut, right? Coconut and rum. Right. So yeah. here you've, you've spruced it up quite a bit. <laughs> I don't. I don't think the the coffee shop banana breads have rum in them, but but it's really become a staple. And I think that you know what people want to pair with their coffee, I guess, is not anything too overwrought or highfalutin. It's you know a cookie, a a, a cake like a cake that would be in your book, uh, or a banana bread because it's sort of comforting. Yes, and maybe something slightly healthier if you're eating it during the day. I'm noticing um, different kinds of flowers also. And obviously, the French have always used almond flour. You know, there's a recipe in here that, that dates back hundreds of years for for an almond cake. Uh, there are recipes that date back to the Middle Ages that use them. So now we're seeing them much more because they're considered healthy and because of the understanding of gluten intolerance. But uh, but you know, one of the one of the things that really struck me thinking about this actually when I was writing is you know so many of the recipes or so many of the ingredients that it, that right now in America we perceive as being very new um, have been around in France for centuries. What and, else besides almond? You know, the use of rose water, the use of orange blossom water, obviously the use of yogurt, uh, the use of um, polenta, right? The use of, the use of olive oil in cakes down in, in Nice in the Medi you know, on the Mediterranean coast. Uh, all of these things have really figured in for so long. Also this idea that's really, really important to the book and really important to me is, is, you know, if you, if you don't fuss with the decorations and you don't add a huge amount of frosting, if any frosting, you actually do get a, you know, a really simple, delicious cake that you kind of can have every day. Uh, you know, I always laugh. I have a couple of French friends who, who, when they come to the States, they will of course always order dessert in a restaurant because it is part of a meal. And if they order cake, they will take a knife and they will scrape the icing off and they'll do yeah. it very discreetly. But, you know, but the, the feeling is, is a, a cake should not just taste of sugar. You don't want you don't want to take a bite of something and just read sugar. You want to take a bite of something and taste nuance. You want to taste a balance of flavors. You want to you want to know what flavor is central to the cake, whether it's a hazelnut or ginger or apple. And uh, and so I really wanted to to kind of to educate on the idea of paring down on ingredients of kind of limiting the list of things that go into a cake rather than thinking that you need to build and build and build. Uh, and, you know, there's a very streamlined beauty to a simple one layer cake, which maybe has a dusting of powdered sugar, maybe a dusting of cocoa, you know, maybe a little bit of chocolate ganache, but is generally not, you know, iced or layered or, you know, decorated with little things. Right? And in what you found researching cakes from beyond Paris, so just, you know, the cakes that regional cakes, is that there is that base level simplicity to all of them, right? <laughs> what are what are some of the standouts for you in other regions? Oh my God. The Far Breton, which is which is a flan and is not a cake. I have maybe two or three recipes in this book, which I had to include, even though they're not cakes. I really wanted to stick just with cakes. But that is just such a beautiful recipe for a, a just a, a delicious flan with some Armagnac soaked prunes. Um, so good, so easy, just silky, delicate, gorgeous. Lots of, uh, there is a lot of booze in this cake. And and the booze is regional, and and it is not. It's not just because I I do like cooking with booze, but I, you know, I think 
again, going back to the French practicality is this idea that if you, if you want to add a dimension of, of flavor to a cake, you know, you, you are just as likely to reach for a bottle of liquor or brandy as you are to a different spice or different ingredient. And that in something as simple as putting, you know, a tablespoon of, of creme de cassis in a cake or in a, or in a, Chantilly, you suddenly do get another dimension of flavor with almost no effort. Those things are, of course, regional. So, you know, you're in Armagnac, you're going to use Armagnac, and in Calvados, in Normandy, Calvados, and in Cognac, Cognac. Uh, so, I I loved kind of looking at the country geographically and and also playing not just with the ingredients, but playing with the with whatever the special alcohol is of that region. And I saw you have several recipes for. Breton cakes, uh, yes. specifically related to the region of Brittany. So, what what are some of those? Uh, that wh- why do the they butter- stand out for you? Oh, I love those. I mean, so so the Breton butter cake is is a cake that to me is truly just a celebration of Breton butter, which of course is fantastic, and uh, and it is it is so simple, and it is a little bit like a shortbread. It's a little bit like a pound cake. It is a recipe that is designed to last at least a week and to get better with every day. And it's very hard to allow it to last that many days. Um, But it actually, again, super, super practical, very, very simple. And you taste it and you really, you do taste suddenly just the essence of butter. But but in quick form, and it sounds that sounds like it's very rich and, and kind of crazy. But it actually it's just beautiful. Uh, and then I did an almond variation, which I love, which has a little bit of almond flour and gives it just a slightly different texture and a and a little bit of a of a different depth of flavor. Another thing I loved playing around with with those recipes was browning butter, which of course is done so often in France, whether you're making trout or making madeleine. And, um, you know, and French butter in particular lends itself to this because it has, it has less water. It has more fat and less water. Uh, and so browning it, you actually don't, you're not losing volume, but you are gaining that incredible nutty flavor that can permeate the back of a, of a butter cake. And, and suddenly it, it just has a level of complexity that is pretty gorgeous. Uh, there's also, uh, a wonderful cake from Nolte that going back to the boozy theme is, you know, is in fact really a rum cake. And is I've, I've had that. It's, it's, it's amazing. Just like the, I can't remember if you have one from Annecy in there, but the, uh, That's a good one. the chef who does that for your next trip, Maxime yes. Frédéric at the Cheval Blanc, he um, has, and it's not even, he's from Normandy, but one of his, like, I think it's his second in command is from Annecy in that area. And so he does a cake specific to that region, which is just absolutely divine. And I I, I could be wrong. There might be a touch of orange blossom, uh, but it's just something that's, again, very hearty, very moist um, and specific to that region. So I like that that's entering sort of this world of almost luxury pastry. He does balance it out with some of these cakes. The other one is, of course, the Dequas, which is from, yes. you know, is, is from Dax and is such a, again, you know, maybe a stretch to call it a cake, but it is, it is layers of meringue discs that are filled with anything from, you know, buttercream, if you want to spend the time to a little bit of spiked or flavored whipped cream, or maybe a, a mix of whipped cream and creme fraiche. Maybe there's a little bit of jam in there. Maybe there's some fruit, maybe there's some fruit on top. Uh, one of my favorite ones was designed for the jet, the Concorde, uh, in its, and is, is just chocolate discs, three chocolate discs with an unbelievably easy whipped chocolate ganache, dark, dark chocolate ganache that has a mousse like consistency. And it is one of the easiest and one of the most extraordinary desserts I've had. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, so, it sounds, this is, this is terrible doing this at 4.30, at least in Paris, where I'm nearing goûter hour, where yes. I should be having some form of a cake, um, and yet I have none. Um, we're, we're also approaching the Christmas season, and so, of course, 
We're hearing lots about the bouche de Noël, uh, other types of Christmas appropriate or holiday appropriate cakes, and you do include the bouche de Noël, which I guess could is sort of a cake and a uh, in a category of its own as well. Um, what do you recommend for anybody who's listening who is not living in France um, and might be intimidated by the prospect of making a bouche de Noël? Is there sort of like an intermediary option or do you have any like key tips for nailing it and not, you know, crying when it doesn't come out the way you want or if it doesn't come out the way you want? You know, it's okay. So two things on that subject. One is it's actually really easy. Um, it is, it is very simply a sponge cake that is, is made in a sheet pan, a genoise. And I think people are scared of genoise because they've tasted them, they've made them, they've tasted them, and they've thought, oh my God, it's so dry. But they're meant to be dry. They're meant to absorb an, an extraordinary quantity of soaking syrup and, and to get their flavor and their moistness from that. So, so they're cakes that are never meant to be eaten alone. So I think people, you know, there's a immediate concern when you look at it and you think, oh goodness, it's too dry, but it's not. But it is it is essentially a sponge cake made in a sheet pan and uh, and then lavishly brushed with a soaking syrup, which is usually flavored. And a soaking syrup is no more than a simple syrup that we would use for the base of a cocktail, that combination of, of sugar and water, with something that imparts a great deal of flavor. Again, that could be rum, it could be Grand Marnier, it could be um, it could be an extract, it could be could be rose, it could be coffee. Uh, oftentimes, I will I will do a simple syrup with espresso, which is so good and so easy, and I'll add a, a tablespoon of rum to that. Brush it onto uh, the sponge cake. Maybe add a little bit of jam again, or a little bit of chestnut puree, or depending on on what kind of bouche noel you want. And again, either filling it with a buttercream or with a creme chantilly. So again, it can a lot of these recipes can be easy, either easy or hard, depending on how much time you want to put in. But mm -hmm. you roll it up and you cover it with ganache, and you take the tines of a fork and you run it down the ganache, so it looks like the bark of a tree. It is something that that can take no time to put together, or you can get very fussy and make lots of little meringue mushrooms and different buttercreams and things like that. But for a simple one, I would just do a chocolate because I love chocolate, and I uh, a chocolate sponge cake, and I would fill it with I would brush it with a little bit of an espresso simple syrup, maybe again maybe spiked, maybe not. And then I would fill it with a whipped chocolate ganache and uh, and maybe add a little bit of raspberry jam in there um, mm. like, and, and roll it up. And again, a little bit more to go chocolate on chocolate, a little bit more of that chocolate ganache. Uh, you know, and suddenly you have something that is very simple, has that festive quality, uh, you know, when you when you slice into it, you get that that beautiful rolled um, look, which I like. But but you know, as as you have so beautifully documented in in talking about how Paris is changing, we are seeing these flavors change. So you know, there's a lot of yuzu, fantastic to make a a, a yuzu bouche noël, uh, macaret lime leaves, a um, lot more coconut, a lot of a um, lot of different spices suddenly being used. A little bit less sweet, maybe. Uh, really fantastic is to make a, a pistachio uh, bouche noel. And uh, so you're making a pistachio sponge cake. Maybe you're taking a little bit of brandied soaked cherries, maybe a little bit of chocolate shavings, a little bit of whipped cream. Suddenly you have a kind of pistachio version on a black forest cake. That right, looks right. Awesome. And then again, for really simple decoration, Blitz in a food processor some fresh pistachios until they form a, a a very very delicate powder, and you can sprinkle that that green powder on top of on a cake. Top. Like yeah, more. yeah. I guess that's that's the real lesson here is that um, anytime you think something's going to be too challenging or intimidating, if the French are doing it at home, it's probably not. 
Exactly. Uh, right. So, I- so just keep that in mind. And, you know, I mean, granted, there are plenty of, of cookbooks and baking books that sell here from the big chefs, but you almost wonder, is it more to own something by these chefs versus going in step by step? Um, I think that, I think it's like the the niche category are is, is the people who actually take the time to try to make something super challenging, but the majority of people are not doing that, and and that's something to to remember, um, especially as now people see all these like you know very attractive, um, entertaining baking videos from French pastry chefs online, and they think you know there's no way I'm going to be able to do this. You know, one of the reasons I think that there is such humility about, or I should say, why so much of French cooking is humble at home is because there is really this divide. There is a sense that food at its highest level is entirely an art form and that that is best left to the professionals to the to the chefs who have you know started their apprenticeships at 13 and and have worked their way up and maybe have gone to you know Ferrandi the great cooking school in France and and have then opened up something very small and then kind of built their career and so by the time you're actually buying whatever they have created or or going and having it at a restaurant, they have trained for decades, uh, and and those are those are the chefs who who have stunning books that you buy as art books because because that level of cooking is an art, and and that at home you don't try and compete with that. It's an entirely separate thing. At home, you're trying to eat beautifully, simply, and well every day. I think I, I like that. Yeah, I think you make a good point. It's true. Well, first of all, I mean, and this is a whole nother topic of conversation, but the appreciation uh, for aesthetics and beauty and, um, and the role that that plays in daily life here, and perhaps other parts of Europe, right? Any of any of the, you know, you look at Ita- the Italian art movements and um, other parts of, of Western Europe that were, were this level of reverence for for the the aesthetics of daily life are hugely important to a sense of peace a sense of self um you know that that it's like integral to their identity in a way that perhaps we were not reared with in america um i think there's you know we're taught other things um i'm not so sure that that's the the most important element no, we're taught to rush. <laughs> well, <laughs> rush and work hard. hard and like we're encouraged in a different way. But, you know, the, yeah. the aesthetics of life and trying to find beauty different. everywhere is not necessarily the, uh, the, the key message. I agree. So I think you've brought it back down uh, to a humble place, which is the sort of the realistic version of, of, of home baking with uh, with ghetto, the surprising simplicity of French cakes. And this is going to be obviously a perfect gift for people to offer at the holidays. Um, so it is available worldwide, not just in the U.S. It is. It is available worldwide on Amazon, absolutely, and and uh, and any other, and basically any other site. Um, absolutely. Well, so- it's beautiful, full of incredible re- recipes and illustrations, um, and really read the head notes. Uh, they're they're charming, and they really lead lead you further into an understanding of why the French bake this way. Um, and I think that was that's obviously the crucial element. So, uh, wonderful job! I can't wait to make my own yogurt cakes again because I'm I'm all for simplicity. Anyone who knows me knows that I mostly run away from anything too challenging. So, so at least in the kitchen, I should say, at least in the kitchen. Um, so Alexandra, really wonderful having this insight from you. And, you know, hopefully now that we're, we're moving into a different phase of pandemic, post pandemic, you'll get to be here a lot more often and eating all those things you love to eat. And seeing you. Thank and, you. And I would love that. Thank you so much. And everyone get your copy of Ghetto wherever you buy your books. That's the show for today. As always, thank you for listening, subscribing, and sharing with friends. You can find all previous episodes of the New Paris podcast wherever you stream your podcasts and on World Radio Paris. If you're enjoying these conversations, please consider picking up a copy of the New Paris book or my recent release, The New Parisienne, from your local booksellers. Until next time, à bientôt.